Good afternoon. We are glad that you're here for our Good Friday service. A reminder to please silence your cell phones. All the hymns today will come from the Red Hymnal, and we'll sing all the verses unless specified otherwise. The heart of our church is summed up in these words. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here, and we're glad you've come. Everyone is invited to lunch immediately following the service downstairs in the North Lounge. I want to thank Nancy Nevins and Donna Marques for making that happen. And you can join us at 10 a.m. this Sunday for a celebratory Easter service, including our chancel choir singing Handel's Hallelujah Chorus and our Easter egg hunt for the kids at 1045. Thank you for being here today, and we hope you find the service moving and meaningful. All right, let us read responsibly. We come to be present with Jesus in his suffering. With the glory of Palm Sunday behind us, and the victory of Easter yet to come. We gather with our breaking and broken hearts in this world that is at once beautiful and holy and tragic. We seek to be present with all of us. We long for a brave and sacred space, a space where we can listen and hope and pray. Let us be that space for each other as we remember the story together. And now let us pray together our invocation followed by the Lord's Prayer. Loving God, through Jesus you meet us with a love that will never let us go. You utter words of mercy and grace that soothe our pain and heal our brokenness. You offer new beginnings out of life's dead ends. Guide us in the way of Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
first word. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So Pilate gave sentence that their, their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, whom they had asked for. But Jesus he delivered up to their will. And they led him away, and as they led him away, they seized Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid him on the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who bewailed and lamented. But Jesus turning to them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never gave suck. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place which is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals one on the right and one on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, and they cast lots to divide his garments. Today, we meet Jesus once again in the midst of deep despair. His closest friends are nowhere to be found, and betrayal is at an all-time high. Angry crowds swell around him, firing their insults to this beaten and worn-down King of the Jews. Soldiers mock him. Those who praised his bold witness and compassion now deny him. In this moment of isolation and misery, we witness boundless love and grace. In the turmoil of the angry mob hurling insults, Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Forgiveness is at work, yes but perhaps in a way we don't expect. If we take a closer look, there is another sentiment unfolding before us perhaps we have yet to consider. Jesus cries out, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. He asks God to do what he cannot amid his human suffering. Episcopal priest David Henson gives insight into the story as he says. There is forgiveness requested in this moment, but not offered. There is forgiveness on the cross, but not from Jesus. It comes from God. He continues, there's a hard and truthful lesson here. That forgiveness in the face of such terrible abuse isn't proffered with ease while the nails still dig into the soul in the moment of pain. We can pray that God will forgive those who bring about our destruction, those who torture and abuse and execute. Indeed, our faith requires that, he says. But there are some evils and wrongs for which our personal forgiveness doesn't come so easily. And we shouldn't feel guilty in our inability to offer this forgiveness while our wounds are still bleeding. Father, forgive them is not the same as I forgive. There are limits to our ability to forgive, and that is the compelling and conflicted, aching and tragic beauty of Jesus' words on the cross today. That he wants his executioners forgiven even when he cannot at the moment forgive. Sometimes this is the most we can offer in our human ability. Father, forgive them because I cannot, for they know not what they do and I know all too well. Forgiveness does not come easily for us. 
and it does not come easily for Jesus on that dark afternoon. It is a lifetime struggle and spiritual quest. Author Anne Lamott speaks humorously to our difficulty to forgive, as she writes. Forgiveness has become a pursuit more important to me than almost anything, she says. Because as I said in an old book I wrote, it's not my strong suit. I always joke that I wasn't one of those Christians who was heavily into forgiveness. I was the other kind, that I was reform, she says. But it's so awful to be a person who doesn't forgive. In my experience, the willingness to change deep down always comes from the pain of not changing. I really believe that earth is just forgiveness school, she says. I really believe that that's why we are here and that we are left without an owner's manual. Author and pastor Reverend Nadia Boltz Weber, she describes a recent visit to a men's prison in Canyon City, Colorado, where she leads a Good Friday service for the inmates. And around the room, they post different sheets of paper reflecting the seven last words of Christ. And those in attendance are asked to go throughout the room and add their own unique thoughts below each of Jesus' words. And below the sheet that reads, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Here are some of the responses written. We never really do, says one. I continually beat myself up. We are all lost sheep without a shepherd. And I forgive them too. I pray this unto myself and God, please forgive me. If I can receive forgiveness for all that I have done, how great and wonderful would that be? Artist Scott Erickson responds to these words that day when he says, Although I find myself in a vastly different place and situation than some of these men, surprising or not surprising, their reflections mirror some of my own thoughts and regrets and hopes and prayers. We have so much more in common than we realize. It's as if two or three of us come together with our honesty and our humanity. We will find Jesus right there in the midst with us, too. Forgiveness is a process. And we are all in pursuit of forgiving and letting go of something or someone. At times, like Jesus, we must offer it up to God for we are limited by our humanity. And at other times, we muster up the ability to work past the hurt and move forward with our lives. Let us go now on this Good Friday in pursuit of forgiveness. When our hearts are too battered, when we just can't offer what we know is needed, might we turn to the one who is able and say, Father, Mother, God, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Amen. The second word. Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let us pray our prayer of confession. Gracious God, we confess that we do not follow Jesus in all that we do. We love with condition. We judge and condemn. We cast the first stone. We do not turn to you as the source of our healing. Forgive us, we pray, and empower us to be imitators of Christ in love and service. Amen. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him vinegar and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? 
and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The third word, woman, behold your son, behold your mother. Let us join together as we pray our prayer in unison. Almighty God, we pray that you will graciously behold us and our earthly families, grant your mercy to those bereft of loved ones, and may your spirit reign in the homes of all your children, that with steadfast faith, we may serve you all the days of our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and made four parts, one for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was without seam, woven from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill scripture. So the soldiers did this, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home.
fourth word. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priest and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults at him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lamina sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We gather today on Good Friday, a day that feels anything but good. Gazing upon the image of Jesus on the cross, we confront the harsh truth. Our world is filled with violence, injustice, and the crushing weight of human cruelty. Here on the precipice of Easter, we confront the brutal reality of Jesus's crucifixion. Mark's gospel, in its raw honesty, presents us with Jesus's anguished cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These words remind us that Jesus wasn't a celestial being untouched by human experience. He was fully human and on the cross. He felt the full weight of injustice, oppression, and the abandonment that so many face. This powerful cry is the primal scream of humanity echoing through the ages. It's the cry of the oppressed, the forgotten, the victims of violence and injustice. People marginalized because of their sexual orientation, their race, or the country of their birth. Look at the scene. Jesus is surrounded by mockery. The very systems he challenged, the religious elite, the Roman occupiers, all contributing to his suffering. His cry becomes a critique of these structures of power, a question not just directed at the heavens, but at all of us. Why do we allow people to be forsaken? Why do we perpetuate systems 
that create such suffering. Jesus' cry is a call to action, a demand for empathy and solidarity with those on the margins. Think of the countless who have cried out in similar ways throughout history, victims of injustice, refugees fleeing war, those battling illness or poverty. In that moment, Jesus becomes one with them. His cry isn't a rejection of God, but a shared lament with all who have ever felt abandoned. This perspective challenges us to see Jesus' death not as a transaction, a price paid for sin, but instead as an act of radical empathy. What does this mean for us in the here and now? It means recognizing the deep injustices that plague our world. The systems of oppression that lead to suffering are not acts of God but the result of human choices. It compels us to act with compassion. Jesus' message was about love and liberation. We are called to work for a world where the cries of the abandoned are heard and addressed. It reminds us that even in the face of darkness, hope persists. Jesus' death wasn't the end of the story. Easter reminds us of the transformative power of love and justice. Let us remember that Jesus' cry wasn't just about the past, but the future. It's a call to build a world where such cries are no longer uttered, a world where the powerful are held accountable, where justice prevails, and where love, not domination, dictates our actions. The darkness of Good Friday doesn't have to be the end. It can be the catalyst for a new dawn, a dawn where we actively work to create a world that reflects the teachings of Jesus, a world where the least are lifted, the marginalized are embraced, and love conquers all. Let this Good Friday be a call to service. Let Jesus' cry be a constant reminder of the work that we will do. Together, let us build the world Jesus envisioned, a world where none are truly forsaken. Amen. <laughs>
word, I thirst. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A bowl full of vinegar stood there, so they put a sponge full of the vinegar on hyssop and held it to his mouth. Let us now read responsively our litany of deliverance. Loving God, we know that we have turned aside from your way of love. Have compassion for all that you have created. From all hardness of heart and blindness of understanding, from pride and pretense, from envy, hatred, malice, and all uncharitableness. In the time of our prosperity and success, when the world spreads its tempting snares. In the season of adversity and affliction, when pain or trouble comes upon us, in the growing infirmities of age, in the hour of death. When the burden of life presses heavily upon us, when our work is difficult, when faithless fears oppress us, when prayer feels empty and our vision of you grows dim. By the remembrance of your loving kindness, and the years of your faithfulness, by the power of the cross of Jesus, by the comfort of the Holy Spirit, that we may serve you in newness of life, that our lives might overflow with love, and that we may follow the way of Jesus in all things. The sixth word, it is finished. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the spirit bearing witness with our spirits that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ.
the seventh word. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Let us read responsibly. On this day of betrayal and death, we remember those times we have not been part, we have been part of the crowd, seeking our best interest over what is right and good. For all the ways we have missed the mark, all the ways we have come up short, may God give us grace. Even in the face of betrayal and rebellion, even in the face of death and denial, even in the face of fear and despair, God's grace knows no bounds. Thanks be to God. peace on this tragic Good Friday. God has not forsaken us. Let us commit ourselves to God who delivers us. Let us hold fast to our hope without wavering. Evil will not have the last word.
the threat of death cannot stop the promise of love. Amen.